for a boy who grew up in pre 1991 and went on to define the first startup that we saw nokri you know what an outstanding venture which we all could look up to and i know you've told this many a times but tell me what it has meant uh, to grow up from there and then power so many companies today you know, you know shada the truth is you work for the day right uh, and therefore if and it's not as if there was one eureka moment where hey now i'm successful or hey now the company is successful it is a daily grind and therefore you actually never feel successful because tomorrow is one more day okay and you got to keep on batting right and and that's how it is so i don't sort of uh, so success you know is a very very uh, uh, crazy thing it's in your head actually right uh, and if you're working every day Uh, you know, because there are newer challenges, you actually never feel successful. Just keep on working. But Sanjeev, I want to ask you: Everyone works every day. Most people work every day. Most people are very, very hardworking, and especially in our country. But some go on to be and and live the journey that you've lived. And if you had to say, ये दो तीन चीजें थीं जो लगता है कि अलग किया, so what would those be? You know, uh, I think the first. Uh, quality or the most important quality an entrepreneur should have is the ability to create trust across the table mm. right uh, trust with customers uh, trust with colleagues trust with co-founders uh, you know trust with investors right and if you're able to create trust you will get good colleagues good co-founders uh, good uh, you know customers good investors uh, and to create trust you have to be fundamentally trustworthy Mm. <laughs> it actually means you got to be empathetic good with people honest uh, think of others first right uh, and yourself after that right uh, and so on uh, and that is a growing up thing you don't uh, suddenly say okay from tomorrow i'm going to be this right it's you know the family you were born in uh, what is the stuff you overheard at the dining table uh, the school you went to your teachers your friends the college uh, the places where you worked at your colleagues and your bosses yeah right? uh, and big all this goes on to shape you and your values and ethics and work ethic most importantly right and tells you what's more important and what's less important and how you should conduct yourself and what's right and what's wrong uh, and if you end up with the ability to create trust across the table i think that's the first big milestone achieved the second of course is uh, look you can't do it without people and you know great people around you and there's so many very very good people i've had the good fortune of working with uh, whether as an entrepreneur or, or before that when i was working in other companies right uh, and they've done stuff and i've learned from them and so the actual the contribution that so many others have made to infoage you know in the last 5 10 15 years may have been a lot more than mine yeah right uh and the company then gets built and it goes on right and the third thing is uh we are very very customer driven consumer driven so understanding the customer understanding the consumer uh and uh you know getting those customer insights and yeah. figure out the unsolved problems and then try to solve them i think that's really important that's at the center of our uh strategy right and the fourth thing that has helped me i would say is that when you're bootstrapping when you you know and i bootstrap for 10 years before we got venture capital uh you know uh you got to do be you got to be able to do every job yourself mm. and frequently do it yourself so it means that mm. uh you really understand the dignity of labor yeah right so early on i have uh, gone to the post office myself carrying cartons of uh, envelopes to be franked for direct mail, for a direct mail exercise i have sat and put it in the franking machine myself along with a, a peon from the office right uh, and i have uh, made sure that the letters got mailed uh, i remember in my first job in 84 or 85 1984 1985 in linjas uh you know we were making a new business uh, pitch to a company where the office was in connot place in one of those buildings on the 10th floor yeah. right 
And uh, we turned up and with all the equipment, the TV, the projector, all this heavy stuff, right? And uh, only one lift was working and doing, and <laughs> the presentation was starting in 20 minutes, right? So I walked up and down 10 floors carrying first a television set. Wow. Came yeah. down, carried a projector, manual labor. Yeah. Right? Now, if you're willing and able to do whatever it takes, then you're really hands on. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and, and that's, and when you're hands on, is when you learn execution. And, you know, the truth is you've got to execute in the right strategy. That's really important. That, the right strategy. But the truth is you spend 98% of your time and energy executing and only 2% of your time strategizing. So you've got to be very good at strategy, but very, very good at execution as well. And you don't learn yeah. execution. And you don't learn execution unless you do it yourself. You know, I have to tell something and then to everyone who knows you and who's observed you will agree that there is a very you know, there, there's two sides or to you which keeps on walking. One is wisdom, very deep insights, and then there is a very childlike innocence. And I think both these things coexist in you at any given time I've seen. Like, you know, you'll be on the stage, you'll be talking to someone, giving advice to entrepreneurs or just having conversation with someone. Tell me how, you know, and, and first tell me, do you see that in you? Do you recognize that these coexist? Well, look, I mean... Uh... If others say so, it, it must be true. Uh, I do not recognize it myself, but if others say so, it must be true. So I accept it. Why I'm pointing to this is that, how do you, over the years, seeing so much, how do you retain this kind of an enthusiasm? Because somewhere I see so many people, over time there is, you know, a sense of jadedness comes in, a sense of uh, a proprietary behavior in a certain way comes in, but you maintain that enthusiasm. And I think that's why people also flock to you. How do you do that? No, look, when I see a young entrepreneur trying to do something interesting, uh, you know, I get enthused. Mm. Okay. So, you know, take a look at uh, Zomato. Right, 2009 or so, I began to use a site called Foodie Bay. And why did I use it? I used it because, you know, I'm a foodie, my son's a foodie. We would discuss and debate on Fridays and Saturdays, where are we going for lunch yeah. on the weekend or dinner on the weekend. And why did you like Foodie Bay? Because it was the only site that all the, had all the menu cards. So you could actually go and see, hey, there's this dish here, and this is the price, and you know, this is in Khan market, and though it's not too far, and you know, uh, why don't we go here? You know, and we discuss and debate and then take a decision. Now, unknown to me at that time, Hitesh Oberoi, uh, you know, who has done so much for Info Edge, right? Uh, you know, perhaps more than me in the last 10, 15 years, right? Uh, you know, uh, he was also using the site. And we had begun this investment program, we had done. Uh, study places, we had done Policy Bazaar, Merit Nation, a few, right? And we were kind of groping, you know, just figuring mm. things out. And they said, have you seen the site Foodie Bay? Yeah. Right? And I said, yes, I have. He says, uh, why don't you consider it for investment? Mm. And the penny dropped in my head, man, I've been using it for a year, you know, and I've not even thought about this as a candidate for investment. How stupid of me, right? <laughs> so I went to uh, Network Solutions, uh, you know, the, the domain name registrar, the, the website, and I did a who is search, a who owns this domain name. I found ad, admin contact name Deepinder Goyal, right? Uh, and then I uh, said, uh, I did a Google search and I found his email ID somewhere, right? And I sent an uh, email saying, uh, Hi Deepinder, have you done food eBay? Are you the same Deepinder? Uh, you know, uh, good work. I use the site. I like it. Uh, can we talk sometime? Right? Mm. Now, Deepinder didn't reply for two days because I had not said why I want to meet him. And he thought I was a Nokri salesperson. Uh, I'm going to try and sell him a Nokri subscription. So he said, you know, I don't want to buy any Nokri subscription. So he said, he didn't reply. Right? But after two days, he did a Google search of my name and he said, oh, oh, okay. And then he sent a reply saying, I'll, you know, and he called me up. Okay, and then we met and we hit it off from the beginning because mm -hmm. I asked him, uh, Deepinder, where did you get this idea from? Ye idea kaha se aya? And he told me a very interesting story. 
which has been documented well enough, and I have said it in many places, that he used to work in Bain Consulting, and you know, Bain in Gurgaon, and Bain was this uh, company where there were maybe 50 or 60 people working in that office, mostly young, mostly male, mostly single, many living away from home, mm. right? Which basically meant that they wouldn't get food from home. Consulting hours were long. Uh, you invariably ended up eating two meals in the office, lunch and dinner. Right? After that, a cafeteria that would not serve food. You could bring your own food and eat it there. Yeah. To make life easy for, for the employees, uh, the admin team had collected all the delivery venue cards of uh, all the restaurants that had delivered to that location and put it in a file folder to be referred to and you can place your order, right? You could call them up and place your order. And Dipinder said, you know, at one o'clock in the afternoon every day, there's a big line to see the file. I have to wait in queue. And then I get it for two minutes, then I phone up and then they, you know, and place the order. And then they'll deliver in 45 minutes. Then I come back and then I eat. It's a huge pain. I got, I'm busy, I'm hungry. I got work to do, I got deadlines to meet. And so one Saturday he came in and he scanned all those menu cards and uploaded them on uh, the, his personal page on the office intranet. And says within two days, the IT infra guy came to me and said, man, what have you done? Why is 98% of the internal traffic going to your page? Right? And he said, that's when the penny dropped. It was the Eureka moment. And I figured that, listen, uh, you know, uh, aggregation of menu cards got value, not just for me, but for everybody. And he began to go out on weekends with his boss's permission to do a personal project. And he began to pick up menu cards from all restaurants in Delhi and CR. When he had 800 of them, he launched a site called Foodie Bay. Mm. And traffic began to come. And that's when I also became a user. Mm. Now, this story told me that, look, he did a hot button because he was solving an unsolved problem. He yeah. had identified, uh, we got a deep customer insight that aggregation of menu cards has got value. He quietly went and aggregated menu cards everywhere and kept on adding restaurants and cities. And, and we invested. When we invested, they were doing one lakh rupees a month of revenue. Now, we didn't know what will become of the site and what will become of the company, but we felt they ought to a good thing. It's early, they ought to a good thing, let's see what happens. And the good people ought to a good thing. So good people ought to a good thing. So look, to answer your question, I get energy from meeting young entrepreneurs. I get energy from uh, listening to creative ideas. I get enthused. Uh, and I like, uh, you know, us uh, in Fuesh to back good people doing good stuff. In the process, yeah. we, we hope to create value for our shareholders. You would be probably very, very few uh, entrepreneurs in our country who has had such an arc in his own journey, uh, you know, built a company very, very early on, got listed and a very, very successful listing. And now you are known that you backed some of these very, very successful, of course, Zomato, uh, uh, Unicorn listed, a very successful IPO. Tell me over the years, has there been a, is there an info edge and your playbook that has evolved ki aise startups achha karte hain aur hum pick, wo us samay waise pick kiya, but abhi kuch playbook evolve, have you evolved something? We have got some thoughts, okay, which yeah. we have not documented, but you know, yeah. in conversations, uh, you know, we all know we have some sort of filter, right? So the first filter and evidence we see is that will the customer actually want what this company is trying to do or does the customer already want it and is there evidence of it mm. right mm. so if you're able to sort of uh, answer that question uh, i think that's the first base yeah in the case of zomato it was clear that the customer wanted it yeah yeah. Uh, even though there were only one lakh rupees of revenue a month, because A, both situation I liked it. I could see clear I liked it. And the, when you looked at the traffic data, they were getting traffic. Yeah. And the traffic was growing. And, the, and they were not marketing. They had no money. So the traffic is growing without any marketing spend. You know, there's something here. Yeah. 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 Case of Policy Bazaar was different. Policy Bazaar mm -hmm. was we invested on a PowerPoint. Hmm. Okay, but uh, what was then the evidence? The evidence was weaker. See, the, uh, because it, there was, the site wasn't up yet. Yeah. Right? So there was no proof out there in the market. But what was the proof? So 
So Yashish Dahiya came to me and he said, I'm willing to bet you're paying 60% higher for your car insurance than you need to. And I said, don't be silly. You know, insurance is standard. Uh, you know, uh, I bought it from a public sector company, uh, New India Assurance. And, uh, you know, it's what every dealer sells. When you buy the car, you buy the insurance. And the dealer gives it to you. And yeah. it's standard price. Why should a uh, same car, same age, brand new car, same model, same person, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, pay a different, uh, be charged a different price. He says, let's take out your insurance papers. I was, had my backpack in the office and my desk, at my desk. My insurance papers are there. I took it out. He said, okay, fine. Now tell me your car model is said year, you know, and so on. Uh, and he did something on his uh, laptop, right? And I think he sent out some emails or got some queries done somewhere. And he got back 10 quotes. And sure enough, the or eight quotes or something, or six quotes, I forget how many. And the lowest quote was 40% lower than what I was paying. And I was saying, my <laughs> God, I, all these years I've been paying this, I am being getting overcharged. Mm. And the penny dropped. And I said, this thing will sell. Because yeah. if there is uh, so much smoke and mirrors, and, you know, in the insurance sector, you know, so people often buy insurance without checking, I felt. I don't, so I used to buy. Yeah. I assumed that the public sector company, standard price, I didn't know. I said, this thing has to work. So even though it was pre-launch, pre-product, just the value prop defined with some data, here's the evidence that, look, you're paying too much. Or you may be paying too much. Did you know Yashish before? So Yashish and Hitesh had been, had overlapped in school for a month because uh, I think Yashish joined St. Columbus uh, in class 11 from Sanaa. And uh, Hitesh left St. Columbus in class 11 for DPS Arkipuram, but they overlapped for a month. And ah. then they were together in IIT in the same hostel, in the same batch. Mm. Okay, so, so Hitesh had known Yashish for a while. And, and as hostel mates in IIT, he really got to know him well. Right? And I had uh, gone for guest lectures to IIM Ahmedabad, uh, you know, three, four times a year, uh, I used to go. And uh, Yashish... Uh, I had, I, therefore, Yashi attended one or two of my classes and I had spoken to him at that time. So, we, I, I mean, it was a passing acquaintance with Yashish for me, but he, he touched him really well. Mm. Right? Uh, and uh, we went in. And so, when he was doing this, he approached us and, you know, uh, because we were investing and, you know, there weren't so many venture capitals out there, at, you know, in, in, in the year yeah. 2008. Uh, this, this flood of VC hadn't begun then. And he approached us and we began to talk and, you know, we liked what they're doing and we invested. So that's the first thing. Okay. Yeah. The second thing, the second thing is uh, the team. Hmm. Right. And they're both actually equally important. Right. Uh, that will this, is this team A, capable? B, is it committed? C, some sort of sense of uh, Attitude, you know, consultative style. Will they look after minority shareholders well? What are their ideas on governance? Will they listen? Uh, you know, are they the sort who can attract talent? Now, many of these are soft factors. <coughs> when you're judging a 28 year old uh, engineer who has three years of experience, hasn't developed a team, right? Sometimes there's a leap of faith. Yeah. Right? Uh, and uh, you sometimes get it wrong and sometimes get it right, and you live with that. There's a confirmation bias. People only talk about the successes. Second, the truth is we've also got lucky. Right? It's not, I mean, if you had told us uh, in uh, Foodie Bay in the year 2000, how big and how well this company can be, I, said, I don't know. Maybe yeah. 50 crore, 200 crore. That will become 1 lakh crores. We would never have imagined. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's not as if we saw everything. Yeah. We got lucky. And let me also tell you, the most credit, the most credit goes to the founders and the management because they did it. We merely spotted them and backed them. The truth is uh, the money is a commodity. Especially in this day and age of excess liquidity, money is a commodity. Now, investors put all kinds of spin. Hey, our money is better than their money. We have network. We have this. We have that. That's <laughs> a lot of rubbish. Right? Ultimately, it's the founders, the management team, the entrepreneurs, the employees, that team that builds the company. And they should get on the credit. We are fortunate that we were able to invest behind them.
Now, I'm sure every possible entrepreneur in the country, startup would be reaching out. How are you processing? How are you processing the requests? Yeah, we have that's a team, we have a bit. great team that actually meets. So, we must be meeting a thousand startups a quarter. We invest wow. in two or three. Well, if not meet, at least talk on the phone now in this day and age of remote working or email or review the plan, right? And if we talk to one, then we start doing the competition. Like who else is in the sector? Because you've got to assess and benchmark before investing. Yeah. Right. Uh, so we have a team of six or eight people which just does this all the time. And they're really good people. And they use these filters. And then, so we've looked at, uh, I've talked about two filters. You know, uh, one is the evidence the customer does want or will want, what I call natural traction. Mm. Does, is this showing signs of natural traction or will it get natural traction? Right. Then is the team. Third is, yeah. look, is there, is there going to be a moat? Can there be a moat? If not today, then tomorrow. Are they building any IP? Is there a network effect possible? What will differentiate from competition in the long run? Because competition will come. Yeah. If there's an already established incumbent in a network effect market, it's going to be a hard battle to fight. So maybe you shouldn't go in. So stuff like that we do. And that's how we assess. Uh, we like to go in early and be the first institution tech because you know, we're not this big balance sheet where we've got $2 billion to invest. But to take a lot of equity, right? If you go in early, you, you know, you, well, so listen, I mean, you don't get that much equity now these days because valuations are up, round sizes are large. There's a yeah. lot of capital out there. So you, you go in early and you try and get a, a deal which is uh, fair for the entrepreneur and fair for you. But for that, you've got to take early bets, really early bets. Which you are continuing to do. We continue to do that. A lot of entrepreneurs watching this today would love to, of course, get an access. So what I'm hearing, in a year, you'll do roughly 8 to 10 deals? Uh, this last one year has been more than that. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. Because the deal flow has been very, very high. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Right? Uh, it's a, the, 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 the startup, the number of very good entrepreneurs who are trying to do startups uh, has, I think, doubled or tripled in the last four or five years. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, therefore, uh, we've had the good fortune of seeing, of having seen many, many, many more really good entrepreneurs in the last 12 months. But yes, 8 to 10 is, would be, a, would be a, a decent year, I think. I've been hearing from some experts and people that India is right now seeing a Tina moment. Uh, there is no option. Uh, and, and, and we are seeing a lot of capital come to the market and a lot of capital is coming and investment is happening. There's this view and then there is this view with the geo, 800 million internet users. India is the last frontier of a large democratic consumer market. I want to understand from you, what do you, you know, and especially in the last 12, 18 months, what we have 65 unicorns, we have 54,000 startups. What do you have to say? About the oh, I think I think both these views are correct, mm. right? Uh, especially if, if China is falling out of favor with the West, right? You will see more capital being redirected to India. But you know, uh, you've got to understand uh, that uh, the Fed, you know, infused four trillion dollars into the U.S. economy post COVID. Yeah. Right. Now this four trillion dollars has to go somewhere, and some of it is coming to India. So there's this massive, massive, massive uh, increase in liquidity, the tsunami of capital traveling around the world and including to India, right? And we must not mistake valuation, right? For a real value being created. Hopefully they will coincide, right? Yeah. But there has been asset price inflation in most markets yeah. in India, right? Public markets are up. Private markets up, small caps up, mid caps up, large caps up in public markets, right? Now, if this $4 trillion had not been infused, uh, you know, the Nokri share price before COVID was 2100, 2200, right? It went down to 1600 uh, when the lockdown happened in March 2020, April 2020. Uh, it's now 64, 6500. I don't know what the price is right now, over 6000. Has the company done uh, 4x better than uh, April 2020? I don't know. Right? And you see that in company after company. 
would there have been 60 unicorns in India if the $4 trillion has not happened? I don't know. Right? Yeah. So we should, we need to take a deep breath, step back, and have a good reality check. Yeah. Meanwhile, if you are getting the capital and can put it to good use, seize the opportunity. Yeah. Always create real value for customers because that is lasting. Valuations may come and go depending on liquidity. To me, Nokri is continues to remain a case study for all the right reasons and also how professionally you've set it up. Like while you said that you did everything, right? Like hands on, you were there doing everything, but you were also someone who was okay to let go of the daily running. Tell us like Abhi, if you have to tell all the young entrepreneurs who are very excited, determined, and of course will figure out their paths. But I think Nokri remains a company which all of us have to look up to. The way it is run, the way it was done, the way you handled it. Look, uh, I think delegation or learning to delegate uh, is one of the hardest things uh, for an entrepreneur to learn. Because entrepreneurs typically are hands-on, they have huge self-belief. Hey, I know best, which is why I'm doing it myself, right? If I didn't know best, I'd be an employee somewhere else. Yeah. Yes, right? Yeah. Now, once you have that belief and then you bootstrap for a while, it becomes very difficult to delegate. Because <laughs> yeah. when you're bootstrapped, you don't have so many people. Yeah. You don't have so much money. You're struggling. Right? What happened in my case was that look, we raised venture capital and we got a whole bunch of people into the company laterally, senior people, who were smart. Now, the truth is, uh, you know, if you get in smart people to the company, they will demand less space. You can't run it the same way. And if you do, they will leave. Yeah. So if you really value talent, you know, when somebody demands space, you will give that space as long as you believe the person is capable. Yeah. And it took me roughly two years post-venture capital, raising venture capital to learn to delegate. But in a sense, it was forced upon me. <laughs> okay, and so I did. And the truth is you can't scale up if you, you don't let go. If you don't let yeah. go, if you don't yeah. have a good team. Yeah. So it's all related that A, you want to scale up. See, if you, once you raise venture capital, you have no choice but to try and scale up. Right? So actually, you know, uh, before the year 2000, I didn't really want to had a large company or build a large organization or found a large company. I was very happy with a small company as long as it was profitable and I was able to get a modest salary. Uh, that was my aim. Okay. Uh, but it so happened that uh, competition was launched, jobs I had launched having raised venture capital. And oh. then we had no choice. So prior to that, I had said no to three inbound offers of investment in the previous six months. I said, I don't want to raise money. Oh. I don't want to complicate my life. We are okay. Right. Uh, and then when funded competition launched, uh, you know, is when I went back into the market and said that, okay, we need to raise money now because we have got serious competition, we've got deep pockets. Uh, and so we raise money. And once you raise money, you have no choice but to try and scale up because, you know, you have taken somebody's money on the solemn assurance that you do your best to build a large company as valuable. Yeah. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a compact, it's a contract. Right, uh, you know, and not just, uh, I mean, it's not a written contract, but that's the understanding on which they gave you the money that you will build a large company, or at least try your best. And so we had no choice but to build a large company. And to build a large company, you've got people, you need talented people. And once you get them in, you know, they will demand their space, their empowerment and everything. Otherwise they're not yeah. good enough. If they don't do that, they're not good enough. You hired the wrong people. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. And then, and then you got to give it if you want to retain them. And that's what happened to me. And then, as that began to happen, I kind of realized that, listen, uh, this is the way to grow. And this is the way to go forward. And so in 2010, four years after we listed, I stepped aside as CEO. Hitesh is now the CEO for the last 11 years. And he's taken the company right. forward. Right. I focused on investing. So I do four or five things. Um, you know, I look at board matters, I look at some governance issues, I look at some, you know, external one interaction, whether it's government, industry, association, some media, uh, and I look at uh, investor relations, uh, you know, and I look at uh, external investing. Do you know, but this is very powerful, 
very very powerful because we talk about you know google uh, founders we have had full of only you know not as many examples right of founders who've stepped to you know get someone else as the ceo at least in indian context to bahut kam hai there are several stories of older larger companies who done this well in right? india in india uh, not in tech necessarily some in tech but not in tech okay, okay so so if you look at uh, an aisha right sir you look at aisha you look at dabur you look at merico uh, you know they've professionalized the management the family has stepped back right uh, you look at infosys uh, sure they went through some uh, you know ups and downs but eventually they seem to got it right yeah right so companies do transition and there will come a time uh, when the founder should not be sort of the person who's person the ceo right so you have to sort of uh, see great companies outlive the founders if you look at what's yeah. a great company last 100 years uh, the greatest company east india company 250 years of course it was helped by government monopoly right <laughs> Okay. Uh, now uh, you look at you know, and so 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 you got to be laying the foundation, if, which basically means you know good teams, next level leadership, next next level leadership, and that will not be great leadership if they're not empowered. But we've not seen that in the tech space as yet, and you're saying that maybe it's too early right now. In general, uh, if you have a good successful founder. the earliest they'll start thinking and talking about succession will be in the early 50s their early 50s right because until okay. then they'll be doing it themselves okay so i stepped in as ceo when i was 47 mm. uh, me, you know it could have been a few years later but it would have had to be done sometime yeah. okay now a lot of the founders are very young in comparison yeah so i mean maybe they'll get there enough of them yeah yeah they would have had to take the company to a certain point yeah where people say now you can if you want to yeah but you know the other thing i want to make about great companies and uh, i think uh, look uh, valuation will happen if you as a happy by product of building a great company right yeah so if you look at a great company any great company uh, anywhere in the world it's the it's the outcome of the a lifetime's effort of a few people yeah so you look at google yeah. 23 years the founders devoted a lifetime as have several senior people there right yeah. look at look at facebook 2005 they still at it 16 years uh you look at microsoft the early team devoted a lifetime subsequent teams devoted a lifetime you look at the old economy you look at general motors which well isn't so great now but was great so so therefore if you want to build a great company you have to commit for a long long time as a founder yeah sanjeev what is next for you you're doing so much you're investing you've seen all the possible successes but of course you'll say that it doesn't feel like it and and there's so much but what is exciting for you because you've seen all these things you've I done think it new companies new ideas young people trying to do stuff uh, that's really exciting right uh, i think a company that you invest behind early and those founders uh, go out and make this proportionate impact and i'm not talking about valuation i'm talking about impact right uh, it, you know so zomato's got a great valuation but to me more importantly uh, zomato is providing a livelihood to 300000 riders zomato is giving business to 400000 restaurants right each of which are employing maybe 5 or 10 people maybe 20 people right uh that is the impact zomato has so valuation is great and fantastic and we love it but see it's not valuation that gives you the satisfaction it is the impact that is the satisfaction valuation is a corollary you want valuation it's important it's necessary but you want to create an impact do you think of ever starting up something else also so sanjeev agarwal of uh, fundamentum early of helion and early of daksh one yeah. day i was doing a panel with him 
right? And uh, somebody asked a question, uh, you know, and uh, at the end of the panel, offline, I asked him, uh, hey, uh, Sanjeev, do you think you'll do another company? He said, no, yaar. I said, kyun? He says, yeah, company banane mein admi ka tel nikal jata hai. <laughs> Dus pandra saal lagte hai. To take the company to some fruition. Yeah. And therefore, if you start at 45, you know, will you have the energy? Are you at a stage in your life cycle? Some people have done it. Some people have done it. I mean, you know, it's not that it's not possible. But that's a question you have to ask yourself. Or do you want to back others who are younger and help them succeed? Now I'm 58. So, you know, will I do another company? I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. So, you see, in the beginning, the company belongs to you. <laughs> then you get on colleagues, employees, some co-founders, and you give them all stock. The company does not belong to you, just you. Then you get an investor, financial investor externally. Then the company certainly doesn't belong just to you. Because now <laughs> you have shoulder agreements on the board, uh, you know, yeah. uh, you know. And then when you go public, you belong to the company. Right? Yeah. So you can't just walk away. How over the years, and then of course, I don't know if there's a right answer. Have you anchored yourself from within? Because you've seen highs, you've seen tough times, you've lived like many people. But of course, today you stand out in the country for the, the achievements, which is very hard. And <laughs> you've worked and got it. But कोई भी journey आसान नहीं होती है मगर आपकी journey में अंदर से कैसे अपने आप को रखा you know um, I quit my job in 1990 and uh, I was mortally afraid because I wasn't getting a salary check where the company could afford to pay me and I'm from a my father was in the government my mom's a homemaker we are not a business family I you know we had been brought up to be risk averse and to study hard and then get a good job and so, you know, uh, I was afraid. But after two years, I began to love the independence. And I was no longer afraid, right? Uh, and around 94, some sort of switch flipped in my head. Because I was no longer afraid. Uh, and I said, you know what? Uh, I will not chase money. Mm. I will just chase good work. Right? Uh, and... When that happened, I was no longer so bothered about money. I was just bothered about doing good work. And I knew that we had to survive and we were bootstrapping. So I was personally very frugal. It kept costs low. Now this frugality has stayed, which meant if valuation goes up or valuation goes down, you know, the company is profitable, so it's okay. And if the company is profitable, you know, you live to see another day. And if you're living to see another day, it's fine. Yeah. And just keep on focusing on doing good work that day at that time. And you'll be all right. Yeah. So I'm saying that since 94, 92, 94, the kick of doing good work. So that happened to me in my head around 94. So I'll tell you what happened. What, what triggered it off. So I was, uh, you know, we were struggling. We were you know, doing whatever came our way to survive, you know, teaching, training, consulting, market research, <laughs> salary survey, you know, Joe, I am here. So one day we got a call from a large corporation, somebody in large corporation. Now I had a marketing background saying, boss, I want a market research project done. Hmm. Will you do it? You know, we were doing anything that came our way. So we went for a meeting and, uh, then we got a brief, we sent a proposal with a quote. He called us in. And he told us, boss, you pad up this quote by so much and you give me the difference. Oh. And, you know, uh, I got silent and I said, I, let me come back to you. Mm. And I sat and thought for two days that, listen, I mean, do I want to be in the business where I'm giving kickbacks to get business? Mm. And I thought for two days and I said, you know what, I don't want this money. It's okay. And I got back saying, look, we're not, we don't want the business. Thank you. 
Okay. And that was the time when I sort of vowed to myself that this, we will just do good work. We will not chase money. This money is not important. But in order to say that, you have to keep your costs low. Because if your costs yeah. are high, then you need that money. And so we, we stayed frugal and we stayed just focused on work. And we said sometime people will come to us for the quality of what we do and not uh, yeah. for stuff like this. Sanjeev, what do you do other than work? I think you always work. That is true. I'm a, especially now work from home. I'm working 12 hours a day, 7 days a week. Uh, but yeah, I read a bit, but not as much as I used to. I, uh, uh, I do stuff around my work, which isn't work. So I meet a lot of mm-hmm. young entrepreneurs who we've not invested behind. I try and understand stuff around business. I, I talk to friends. Uh, friends means school friends, uh, class, uh, uh, college friends, um, friends from I am, right? Uh, I, uh, you know, in the second wave of COVID, starting April of uh, till mm-hmm. June for three months, I was uh, a lot of us in the company, including Hitesh and our head of admin, we have almost full time, twenty four seven, trying to help people. Yeah. Uh, in the company, outside the company, you know, people we didn't know. Uh, I have, I support a few, we support a few philanthropies, including Ashoka University. Sometimes I get involved in those. Right? But yeah, that's also work, but it's not co- company work. My up or down. You know, it's great to say, and I'd love to say it, that look, work life balance, really important. Um, it is true, it is important. But if you're a startup, you know, you know, it's going to be very hard for you to succeed if you say, hey, work-life balance is very important. I will not work beyond 6 p.m. It doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, you have to, I mean, you know, you have to be obsessed with the idea. The idea has to own you. Yeah. Only then will you will you make it succeed. It's, it's really hard. It's really hard to make a startup succeed. But what is your fundamental belief in the India story? 1.4 billion people are. Huh. Population young. Yeah. Now you got to be there and spot the opportunities and take advantage. There's only one other country in the world which has got a higher population. <laughs> right? And we have seen how well that economy has done until recently. Okay, you're the analyst for this sector, you're the analyst for that sector, you're the analyst. Now, now we need three investments here, two investments there, five investments there. We don't do it that way. We simply say, let's just meet startups. We had a thousand invest in three, four, five. Mm-hmm. If we if we had done sectors, right, we would say, you know what, uh, we you know we, we are in four classified categories. We automobiles nahi kiye. We must do automobiles. Logical, it completes our portfolio, right? But then we would invest in the fifth automobile side, which is bound to fail. Yeah. So as far as we are concerned, auto classified is a ship that has sailed. We're not on it. If we had done sectors, <laughs> the top down, we would never have found Zamato. Yeah. We would never have found you know, policy. You know, somebody had told me in 2010, uh, you know, Sanjeev, why don't you look at restaurant listings? It might be a great space seven years from now. And I would say, are you crazy? But we met the Foodie Bay guys. We liked what they were doing. We liked them. We went in. Uh, if somebody had said, you know what? We think insurance comparison may be a big vertical 10 years from now. The, if we look at that sector, there was no sector. There was no sector. There was no restaurant listing sector. There was no insurance yeah. comparison sector. They made the sector. Yeah. Right. So we look at good ideas, good people. We see what's bubbling from up underneath. And why should we be constrained by our imagination? Our imagination is four sectors. Who entrepreneur is doing? Okay, imagine there is no sector. As Indians, it feels proud that you are, yeah, you're helping and you're there with us. Yeah, something to look forward. I'm not sure I deserve it, but thank you so much. No, you do. You def- if anyone does, then you definitely do. Thank you. Thank you so much.